they reveal to you in their presentation the trials, tribulations, and successes of their research. And in getting them to talk, hopefully in understandable terms, because it's got to, we've got to treat us like the general public, we want them to share their research strategies, their attempts to unravel nature's secrets, and there are aha moments, which I hope are plentiful, when everything was made clear and a problem is solved. As these speakers talk, I'm hoping that you will find nuggets of wisdom that may be useful in your own work, that may lead to a collaboration, even to ideas for new work that straddles multiple disciplines that would not have occurred otherwise. My role as moderator is to make sure that speakers stay within their time limits and at the end, to open the floor up for questions and comments so that the ensuing discussion, likely I hope, will clarify any uncertainties and flash up all the topics that have been covered. Alright, now it's my pleasure introduce the first of our two speakers, Boris Dyatkin. Boris is a fourth year PhD student in materials engineering where he is working under the supervision of Yuri Gogotsi, one of the of stellar professors. His area is nanomaterials, in particular understanding the structure and surface properties of carbon materials and their application in the electrochemical energy storage systems. Boris graduated from Penn, as I told him just now, I won't hold that against him. <laughs> he has worked in the industry before coming here. He recently completed stints at outside labs such as the Armour, uh, US Army Research Lab at Dalian University of Technology. And he's currently spending time at so the first center at Oak Ridge National Lab. Boris is a very popular speaker on the lecture seminar circuit, as I found out from looking at his CV. And besides that, he plays a very active role too in professional and student extracurricular activities. For example, he's the former president of MACNET, which is of course the Materials Engineering Graduate Student Network. The title of his talk today is Threading the Needle finding common themes in energy materials research. Boris, it's all yours. Thank you for that uh, great introduction, and thank you all for coming to our talks here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some of the experiences that I've had researching energy materials, energy systems, and some themes that I've kind of carried from one to the next, some common things that I've found uh, so I'm going to just go over some of the demands for energy and some systems and some conventional no notions which may or may not be accurate. Um, I'm going to go through some experiences that I've had with energy generation uh, and energy storage and how I was able to apply them uh, in attempts to make some of the solutions to some problems a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote that I read uh, not too long ago that uh, may not be the most conventional way of looking at things, but it's also something that I found to be very much true. And the quote is, electric cars should be called what they really are, or they're called power. I mean, if we think about it, electric car is one of the symbols of green energy. It's something that comes to mind with a lot of people when they speak, speak about new technology, something that's environmentally friendly. But it still has to have some source of energy that's going to fill up the battery that this electric car will then use. So where does that energy come from? Well, in the United States, the plurality of energy comes from sources such as coal or natural gas. In uh, China, which is the largest economy as of this year, it also the vast majority of it comes from non-renewable sources. So it's not like these cars are able to generate energy and store this energy from renewable sources all the time. And it kind of varies from region to region, but 
there's so much more to looking at whether this car is actually environmentally friendly. And when we start to actually look at the entire pathway, we see that there are a lot of problems that kind of really uh, take a hammer to that notion. So first off, I, mean, I think that it goes without saying that energy from non-renewables is not environmentally friendly. But if we want to get energy out of solar cells, we also generate a lot of toxic waste in, in, as, uh, during the manufacturing of these solar panels. And parabolic solar panels result in the deaths of thousands of birds uh, in the deserts in California and Arizona because of, the, of them heating up the atmosphere and attracting these birds with um, basically large shiny objects. Not very environmentally friendly. So let's go down the pathway. Um, when we need to then transmit this energy from our generating sources to um, where it is being used, a lot of energy gets lost in the process. And this is an area where we can definitely improve our efficiencies. Um, so then uh, the energy can be stored. And if you notice, you've probably seen that many of the batteries in your cell phones, laptops, etc., have a sticker that says, do not discard. And that's because these systems right now um, have a lot of toxic materials in them uh, that make them very harmful to the environment if they're just dumped out in the landfill with no additional treatment. Uh, furthermore, they, these materials right now also um, have a lot of inefficiency in them, either in the ability to store a lot of energy or output this energy efficiently. And uh, that's what I'll go into in just a little bit. And then finally, when we use this energy, again, many of our devices uh, right now show that if you hold your cell phone and use that for many hours, it will heat up. That entire heat is just a sign of energy not being used efficiently, and actually your energy storage system not being used efficiently. And as I mentioned before, all of these eventually go into the landfills, uh, and without um, having something that's recyclable or something that can be easily disposed of without causing harm to the environment, uh, we're also not really doing a whole lot of uh, uh, sustainable uh, energy storage or management. So by working on, by basically finding energy and environmentally friendly solutions and increasing efficiency in this entire pathway, we can decrease our demand on non-renewable sources a little bit and we can minimize the harmful impact of energy demands, which are constantly growing. We can minimize their impact on the environment. So most of my work is primarily dealing with energy storage and a little bit of work into their subsequent disposal. <coughs> that's what I'll be discussing today. So um, when we look at how we evaluate uh, something that stores energy, uh, we need to consider the energy density, so the amount of energy that it can store per unit of mass or unit of volume, and also the amount of energy that it, how quickly it can output this energy. This is the power density. And there are, most technologies, as you can see, have quite a bit of trade-offs. So some materials can store quite a bit of energy, but may not be able to output it efficiently, and vice versa. And obviously, our goal is to maximize all of them, uh, which may or may not be possible. And therefore, we need to optimize the materials from the bottom up to make them uh, more efficient by looking at the nanoscale properties of the materials that we put into these systems, uh, finding new theories and new developments that we can use for each of these environmentally friendly approaches, and possibly putting some of those uh, together into systems that may optimize, take the best of both worlds and do some sort of a hybrid approach. Actually, a good example is the humanoid robot, or Cubo, with which um, I worked a few years ago. Uh, and I had the um, opportunity to evaluate its uh, power system. So you may have seen this uh, uh, robot before. There are a lot of uh, demos of it uh, during Tai Chi that was done by the School of Engineering. But uh, when you look at the motor functions of a particular motor, such as, for example, doing a, a pitch of an arm or roll of a joint, um, even though the functions are occur fairly regularly, the power consumption, this red curve here, unfortunately does not really operate in sync with these functions. So there are many large power spikes. And realistically, there are no batteries right now that can take that kind of uh, uh, unwise abuse. Uh, and therefore, when the, this robot has primarily been operated being, while being plugged in to the electrical circuit, um, when used with a battery, these uh, batteries lasted only about 30 minutes, and 
Uh, they degrade, their use degraded very shortly thereafter. Uh, and an approach that has been proposed that would be perfect for a system like this is to use that battery to store the bulk of the energy and to output it at a steady rate, and then use a circuit that uses supercapacitor and a controller that when a demand to output large amount of current comes in, such as when it needs to lift an object or move one of its larger joints, uh, the supercapacitor can handle that function. The supercapacitor becomes drained in the process, uh, and their uh, battery keeps operating at the same rate as it was before. By the time the robot has to do that function again, uh, the supercapacitor can be recharged because it can charge and discharge very rapidly. And uh, I'll go into that in short. My uh, first um, experience dealing with energy actually came during my industry job at a company called Alumi Fuel Power Inc., which was located in the University City Science Center uh, just down the street here. I actually started working with them while I was in undergrad. And the premise of the company was that they took um, cartridges filled with aluminum powder and some additives, um, added water to them to generate hydrogen and heat, and put it in appropriate reactor configurations um, that would allow it to um, use this hydrogen to fill uh, weather balloons, to launch radiosons into high levels of the atmosphere, to power fuel cells, and also use the heat and hydrogen to power hybrid generators, which may use a combination of turbines and fuel cells to power something like unmanned underwater vehicles, um, provide boosts to some other uh, to uh, engines and some other energy applications. Um, uh, so again, my job there was to optimize the combination of uh, additives and fuel powder and design the appropriate packaging to generate the appropriate um, levels of hydrogen and heat. Now, I um, uh, started again by taking the, uh, the nanoscale analysis of reaction products. And since there are several different reactions that are possible uh, for the reaction of aluminum and water, by analyzing the products of the reaction, whether it was bomite or bayerite, those were the most common ones, I was able to determine what kind of reaction conditions took place at each one. And I found that by analyzing um, elements of my reaction after specific conditions, I was able to correlate reaction yields with temperatures that were uh, generated. And again, the, the, whether we want a high temperature depends on the, whether we want to use the heat from the reaction or if we want a slower reaction, because reactions have different rates, we may change the conditions to, you, uh, to uh, make a slightly different reaction more dominant. Uh, so, um, to actually do these analysis, I built a uh, reactor um, to specifically test conditions such as temperature, uh, pressure, and relative reaction yields. And my goal in, for the project was to find a reaction mixture that can power a fuel cell that would be back, uh, that would be on board an unmanned underwater vehicle like this one. Some uh, being currently developed by a lot of private companies and also by the U.S. Navy. And the objective, the objective was to put this powder into cartridges that would have the appropriate configuration to allow a steady release of hydrogen to fill up this fuel cell. Um, so by changing both the powder combination and the packaging, so just taking just both powder with no, with no real packaging, I had a fast reaction that gave me very low yields. But then packaging it into standard pouches and arranging them in the appropriate geometrical configuration, I was able to slow down the reaction to appropriate levels. And I was able to then increase the yield to get to the point where 95% or more of the fuel mixture is used, which is essential because we don't want to carry a lot of dead weight on a submersible. And so this reaction was then used to put into cartridges for the proof of concept test rig that, that was uh, then designed that would be able to actually fill up the fuel cell. So during the course of this study, I had to do a lot of evaluation of energy densities and looking at the scales of the system. And one thing that I mentioned before, we need to make sure we don't confuse energy generation and energy storage. And unfortunately here, uh, this approach also had this very same mistake. 
because the aluminum that uh, we used uh, didn't, wasn't, there's no pure aluminum in nature. It has to be also purified using the Bayer process, for instance, converted from aluminum oxide to aluminum. And when we actually look at how, we get, how much energy we need to put in to be able to store energy that we can then use uh, to fill up our fuel cell. So if we need to gener generate hydrogen, either from the reaction with aluminum or using something like electrolysis, we see that hydrogen is actually one of the most inefficient ways to store energy, um, particularly because of the energy demands that are needed to generate the hydrogen and its low density making us need to input additional sources of energy to actually compress it and store it into something that can fit, for instance, uh, in a car. And this is really why, uh, despite all the hype that occurred maybe in 2006 with hydrogen highways, as of right now, there are no realistically no economically viable hydrogen powered cars and it's unlikely that there ever will be. So um, I stopped working there. I started uh, my research at uh, Drexel University and my work here has been focused on electric double layer capacitors or uh, supercapacitors. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a traditional capacitor where there are two parallel plates with either vacuum or dielectric in the middle and there's an accumulation of charge at the two electrodes. Now, the supercapacitor takes a slightly different approach where instead of a dielectric, there's a highly porous material with a very high surface area. So um, when we look at a traditional capacitor, uh, that surface area is well over 1,000 square meters per gram. And this is accomplished by using a highly porous carbon material. So. Um, each pore is the size of a nanometer or less. And uh, there is an electrosorption of ions from an electrolyte. And when we talk about an electrolyte, it can be something as simple as just salt. Or it can go to something complex, some um, more complex salt dissolved in an organic solvent. Uh, and, when we, uh, and the structure of this double layer involves a layer of ions and counter ions on the surface and an oscillation of this double layer throughout our entire system. Now this generally results in very high energy densities, much higher than traditional capacitors. However, not quite at the limit of, of uh, something of Faradaic energy storage systems such as lithium ion batteries. And a number of different applications already use this approach. Um, there, is a, um, uh, there is a trolley bus in Shanghai which uses supercapacitors to get from one stop to the next the supercapacitor is completely drained during this trip, and uh, the time that the, during which the passengers uh, get on or off the bus is enough for the supercapacitor to recharge up again. Uh, it can be used in cars such as a new Mercedes cars uh, for to generate energy from regenerator braking. Uh, when you apply the brakes, usually it's a very short amount of time. So a supercapacitor, because of its ability to charge and discharge rapidly, can store that energy very efficiently. Um, it can be used to power some standalone uh, street lights just using a solar panel and a supercapacitor bank. And because of the stability of the system, these can be operated maintenance free for over 10 years. It can be used in some low power applications such as watches and uh, flashlights. And also can be used to power high power systems such as the emergency doors on the Airbus 380. Now, unfortunately, um, all of those that you saw before are very so much re represent very small parts of the market. And that's because the material has still has yet to be optimized. In particular, when we look about the amount of energy that we need for the system, uh, operating it at higher voltages will give us the most return on our investment. However, uh, most of the new electrolytes that are being developed cannot be used to their full potential in this system because they break down and over time, they degrade our supercapacitor. And this is in part because the surface of the carbon, which has not really been studied until now, um, is not really fully optimized for these high performance electrolytes. Um, so my thesis work is to decouple surface properties from such as surface chemistry and graphitic features on the surfaces of these carbons from uh, narrow pore diameter. And quite a bit of work has been done to properly confine ions in pores, but the other effects have not really been decoupled from it. So my work was to, to find systems that can actually accomplish this goal. 
Uh, so I use the various treatments of, um, uh, such as oxidation of porous and non-porous carbons and vacuum annealing them at high temperatures uh, to remove these groups uh, to change the surface chemistry or graphitic structure. And what I found is that although I expected that by making the material more graphitized and more conductive, I would improve their capacitance, uh, removing defects from the surface actually hurt the material quite substantially because these defects uh, help uh, us store more charge on the surfaces by changing the conduction and valence bands of the carbon. And that's something that, that's a theory that's currently still uh, being developed. Uh, when I try to deposit different functional groups, such as um, oxygen on porous and non-porous systems, I found that, again, that um, I was able to improve the gravimetric capacitance of systems that have these functional groups um, on the surface. I was able to also see how we can use these groups to change the voltage window of our system, and I found that, um, uh, that having, there, there's quite a bit of trade-off in terms of what kind of mechanisms cause breakdown in porous and non-porous systems. If there are functional groups in porous systems, they may react with the electrolyte in the pores. If there are no, uh, no functional groups on the surfaces, then the ions themselves can still break down under high voltages. And that is something that can substantially um, raise a big question of, can we actually um, improve the voltage window of our system? I actually um, analyzed uh, some of these samples at um, Oak Ridge National Lab using the spallation neutron source, and I did quasi-elastic neutron scattering uh, of materials that had different functionalizations. Um, I won't go through all of the methods that I attempted. Suffice it to say that I was able to deposit specific functional groups on the surfaces. Um, and I found that uh, when I did neutron scattering, I found a different response uh, a different amount of elastic scattering and changes of elastic scattering after I put I, uh, the, my electrolyte into pores. And comparing them between uh, the samples that had electrolyte and did not have electrolyte and seeing the differences between them helped me um, reach the conclusion that there are quite a lot of intermolecular interactions uh, that actually correlate quite well with the electrochemical results that I obtained. And these um, suggest that there are a lot of effects uh, that, uh, of interacting ions with surface uh, features on these porous carpets that are still need to be studied. <coughs> and therefore, right now, with this work, I still have quite a lot of questions to answer and a lot more theory that needs to uh, be developed to properly explain uh, these systems. Because as of right now, um, it's unclear what kind of defects are needed on the surfaces to actually improve. Uh, their uh, their performance and their capacities. Um, I was actually able to apply some of these approaches during my time doing research at the Army uh, Research lab Laboratory in Adelphi, Maryland. Uh, the challenge that they're working with there is uh, they have a lot of forward operating bases, which right now are used diesel uh, power generators uh, for their energy supply. And they operate many diesel power generators at 85% capacity so that in times of high power spikes they can account for any increased demand. But this is, results in very inefficient operation of these generators. And uh, especially since these are often in remote locations such as Afghanistan, uh, getting fuel to them, which is not only increasing our reliance on unsustainable energy sources, but also makes it much more difficult and expensive to get um, uh, this, flam this flammable fuel out to these bases, which is, presents a big security problem for the United States. Um, so what uh, the technology that is being developed at the Army Research Lab uses a dual intercalation graphite battery. A traditional battery uses a graphite anode and lithium cobalt oxide, which, by the way, also uses unsustainable sources, um, as the cathode. But in this system, a high voltage electrolyte was developed uh, to use, that can use both graphite cathode and anode to power, to be able to produce um, an, a lithium ion battery that can store sufficient energy to be able to operate grid level energy storage systems. Um, so my work there was to improve its efficiency and I used very similar approaches that I used for double layer capacitors to modify these surfaces 
and to find combinations of cathodes and anodes uh, that can actually give us the, the, the desired improvements in uh, energy efficiency and the amount of energy that we can store. And I found, for example, that making hydrogenated anodes and oxidized cathodes give me the best uh, opportunity to increase efficiency, capacitance, and long-term cyclability. Um, one thing I forgot to mention with both capacitors and batteries is that many of them right now rely on materials that contain a lot of uh, fluorine, uh, a lot of metal, and a lot of sulfur, which uh, when disposed of incorrectly can cause substantial harm to uh, the environment. Uh, a lot of these compounds are uh, carcinogenic, for instance. Uh, a lot of them, when combusted, produce fluorinated compounds which can damage both the equipment that is, being, that is used to incinerate these devices, so we can do damage to our incinerators, and also they can do damage to the environment nearby. And this is a problem that is present in both supercapacitors and batteries. So the battery concept that I just showed can use a grab an all carbon electrode system. Now, my work previously at Drexel also involved designing a supercapacitor that is composed of predominantly all carbon components for each important component of the device. Uh, and so I was able to find alternatives such as filter paper instead of fluorinated separator, um, a um, polyvinyl acetate and sodium borate binder to bind the particles together. So those of you who may have seen this used as a slime demo in chemistry, so again, very simple, very affordable solution. Uh, finding carbon foil as a current collector instead of some metallic alternative. Uh, and basically finding a uh, uh, a polymer-based packaging that when this device is completely combusted leaves behind absolutely no residue. Now, I'm sure that if you threw a regular battery into the incinerator, uh, don't do that by the way, um, you're going to find that uh, a lot more than 3% of it gets left over and the material that's combusted causes a lot of environmental harm. So my hope is that uh, the work that was done today was able to uh, determine here that the findings can be used to make supercapacitors more sustainable and it can be applied to batteries uh, in the future because a lot of them use the very same components. So um, clearly a lot of work, more work needs to be done to make sources that we now consider to be sustainable to be truly sustainable. We need to evaluate the entire energy pathway uh, including where we get the materials how we generate our energy, what kind of a carbon footprint it leaves behind, and how we can make it both affordable, because that's, that's, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks for green energy, and make it more efficient. And then maybe we can make our, uh, uh, our uh, electric cars slightly more environmentally friendly. Um, so I'd like to thank all the various researchers with whom I've uh, worked over the years, um, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time.
you for, for staying here for my talk. I know it's just about 20 more minutes to wrap up my story. Uh, I'll try to stay very simple throughout my presentation. I won't try to kind of give some unnecessary details. Biology does involve a lot of complex assays and complex you know, chemistries sometimes, but I'll try to stay on the path of being simple. So the title uh, of my talk is MicroRNAs, Small Engines, Big Power. Just a quick primer on what all of us have always known in the field of cell and molecular biology. A very famous scientist, Dr. Francis Crick, who is known for his discovery of DNA structure. Uh, right after discovering the DNA structure with Dr. James Watson and getting Nobel Prize for it, he kind of noticed a very simple flow of information in the cell, which he called that central dogma of molecular biology. It simply states that, you know, DNA, which is the genetic material, codes uh, for a specific message corresponding to every gene. Uh, and that message is called RNA. That message then travels outside the nucleus and actually codes for a specific protein corresponding to that message and that code generated is the ultimate product called a protein. So it's a very simple flow of information. And the human genome possesses about 35 to 40,000 different genes. Each gene will create a specific message, a specific RNA. So 40,000 genes will create 40,000 RNA molecules, which individually, once they travel outside the nucleus, will form approximately 40,000 different products uh, corresponding to each message. And that is what is known as central dogma. It's kind of, it kind of still holds true for most of the part, but there have been exceptions to this flow of information. So, in 2006, Dr. Fire and Dr. Meadow uh, got a Nobel Prize for their work in the 1990s. What they did is they discovered that the flow of, the flow of information is not complete. It can, it can stop at the level of RNA. So they discovered that DNA, a gene forming RNA, that's true. But sometimes that RNA may not go on to form a protein. So they found out a class of RNAs which they called as non-coding RNAs. So they're non-coding because they don't code for any protein. And you can see in the diagram on the right that there is an RNA which is the precursor RNAs kind of fold back on itself. It folds back and gives the gives the illusion that it's double stranded, but it's not double stranded. It's a single strand of regular RNA, but it folds back on itself and forms this hairpin. That hairpin is then identified by various cellular enzymes in the nucleus and outside the nucleus that basically cleave it and mature it after maturation is what forms this is what is known as a microRNA. Now the role of this microRNA, as I said, it's a non-coding RNA, so it won't form any protein. That's not its role. Its role is to basically uh, target a growing polypeptide chain and basically target a, a mRNA whose job is to make protein. Stop it, stop that mRNA from making that protein. So it's kind of playing the role of letting other genes not make what they're supposed to do. For instance, uh, this case it doesn't work. So for instance, this mRNA is supposed to make a protein according to the central dogma. But what this microRNA does is sits on top of this mRNA, it base pairs with it, and then that stops this chain of mRNA to do its job. The job it has to do is to make a protein. So there is no protein. Now you must wonder why a cell does that, because if it didn't want that protein corresponding to that particular mRNA, it should not make the mRNA, why is it making the mRNA? So it's like counterproductive for the cell in terms of its energy conservation. It makes uh, mRNA, then makes another microRNA to stop that mRNA from making the protein. Then why do you make those mRNA in the first place? It involves a lot of energy from this. So that's been a puzzle that's kind of not very well solved. People still argue 
and you know, one year or the other that it's overall less energy consuming for a cell to keep making mRNAs and then later use the microRNAs as fine tuners or fine controllers. So the list of microRNAs, remember microRNAs are no different from any regular RNA. They also get made from a gene, like any other protein coding gene, there is a microRNA coding gene. So the list of microRNAs that we know is compiled by a very comprehensive database. It's called MIRBase. It's maintained by the University of Manchester. And uh, if you see on your right here, you can see that this, this database was uh, updated in June 2014 and it registers 28,645 different microRNAs and the list is always expanding so we are learning so much more about our genome that it doesn't only code for about 40,000 different proteins it codes for so many more uh, pieces of information that are called microRNAs they don't manifest themselves they are hidden from the cells phenotype because they don't make proteins but there is so much information a cell has that is just beginning to get explored. So as I said, human body is made up of so many different types of cells. A specific microRNA can perform different functions in different cells. So one microRNA can target a specific mRNA in one cell type, let's say an adipocyte. Same microRNA can target a different target in a different cell. So same microRNA is possessed with the ability to control so many different genes and so many different cells. And that's what the complexity is. In my lab, uh, what we did was to understand the role of microRNAs in the immune system. The immune system is also pretty complex. So we decided to understand the role of microRNA regulation in a specific immune cell subset, which is dendritic cell. It's a cell that is very, very crucial to play a uh, Antiviral immune response. So we targeted one small set of questions, uh, set of you know basic goal of the study was to understand how your body uses microRNAs to kind of generate an antiviral immune response. So that let, lets me to basically introduce you to basic protein, very very common in the field of immunology. It's called intron alpha. It's a protein. It gets secreted from any cell that is infected by the virus. It can be a hair cell, it can be a fat cell, it can be any cell in the body. Once it's infected with the virus, it, it secretes intron alpha. The role of this intron alpha is to basically uh, warn the other neighboring cells to basically be alert that there is a virus. And that intron alpha, it binds to a receptor on the surface of all the cells in the neighborhood and basically initiates a whole cascade of signaling that ultimately results in, in secretion of a lot of different antiviral proteins, a lot of different proteins within the cell that counteract the virus. The question we were faced with was, is it only the protein coding genes that play a role in antiviral defense? Can the microRNAs, like we know, this do so much wonderful uh, job? Are those microRNAs also responding to the interferon alpha that is secreted by the infected cells. So we asked a very simple question. And uh, you know, of course, back in the time that we were asking this question, a very important study came out in Nature, Nature that shows that yes, interferon can, can indeed modulate the expression of so many different cellular microRNAs. And that can be one of the ways a cell fights infection. So it's not always attributed to a protein coding gene, coding for a protein. Sometimes the microRNA can do the job of controlling the virus. So back to my question, how microRNAs regulate uh, intron alpha mediated functions? It could be different for different cells. So we focused on a cell, as I said, dendritic cell. It's a cell which is the primary uh, player in the generation of immune response. Without the cell's activity, you can't have a good response against the virus. So I'll just delve into my data without any time. 
what we found was that Infra Alpha, we had a library of about 500 different microRNAs. So remember I told you there about 28,000 microRNAs? You can't possibly study each one of them. You can, if you want to save some, you know, save some time and more importantly <coughs> save some money, you can handpick the microRNAs based on you know, literature and based on some bioinformatics. So we basically, uh, you know, selected 500 different microRNAs and we wanted to ask a very simple question. What happens when these dendritic cells are treated with intron alpha that may be getting secreted from the infected cells? So what we found out was there was one microRNA out of many different patterns that I'm not showing you today. One that I want to show you today is one microRNA, the story which we followed all the way, was microRNA 21. You can see we measured the amount of this microRNA in cells that are not treated with infrared alpha, called the control cells, and cells that are treated with infrared alpha in the black bar, you see that as early as eight hours, you see that this microRNA, the levels of this microRNA are going down. We use a few PCR, it's called real-time PCR, to basically measure the levels. So eight hours, beginning eight hours, the levels are significantly down, and then they keep down persist persistently. 24 hours. So that was our entry into understanding how infrared alpha can modulate various microRNAs. Then the, the, the bigger question, as I explained, you know, when a microRNA binds to the mRNA, to the target mRNA, the mRNA that, that microRNA doesn't want to form protein, it binds it and then this blocks it. The area of the mRNA where it binds is called UTR called untranslated region. So consider, for example, the area within the mRNA that this microRNA binds. This is the area within the microRNA that the microRNA 221 will bind. If I somehow intelligently use and harness an enzyme called luciferase, paste this luciferase on the upper end of this binding site, what will happen is, if this 221 binds, the protein will not be formed, which means that you won't see any luciferase protein being formed, because this 221 directly blocks to binding of 3' UTR in that microRNA. So this is the assay we develop to basically make sure what mRNAs that microRNA 221 binds to. What happens is, as a result of this binding, what happens is either there is translational repression, meaning the chain is blocked and it cannot form a protein, and eventually that blocking can actually lead to degradation. In both scenarios, the ultimate the output is that the luciferase enzyme is less because it's not allowed to form its protein. So luciferase is a bioluminescent enzyme. You can very easily measure the levels of luciferase by a very simple reaction. So this basically tells us about three targets that we screened from a lot of putative targets, eventually zoning on to these three potential targets of 221. As I said, if the 221 binds, the luciferase activity will go down, confirming that it actually binds it. If it doesn't bind, there will be no reduction because chain continues to form a protein. So through you know screening a lot of putative potential targets, we we actually identified three protein coding genes that are directly controlled by microRNA 221. What these proteins do is another big question which we have actually answered. I can't show all the data we have, but it turns out the first two proteins are actually what controls the survival of the cell. So a dendritic cell, if treated with too much infrared alpha, is meant to die soon. It has to have a very quick life cycle. So it means that microRNA 221 going down, the levels going down, the target, which is bcl 211 or CD101C, the target should feel happy because it's like the microRNA that keeps me down is going down, which means I can stay up. So these two proteins stay up. And that causes the death of dendritic cells. 
This is another protein which regulates some other aspect of the cell. So I'll quickly show you what I meant by cells back. If I use the entire sense of my product of my data and send it inside the cell, this entire sense will actually bind to 221 and stop. So that actually leads to death of the cells as shown by change in percentage of dying cells from 7% to 14%. So if you actually block 221's function, you can actually increase the cell death which means that intron alpha deliberately keeps it down to cause dendritic cells to die. Now shift a little bit, you know, shift the gears a little bit. We took a cohort of uh, patients that had HCV infection. They had infection with hepatitis C virus. We wanted to test the suitability of intron, intron alpha and its effects on the cells. So when you treat the cell, when we treat these patients with intron alpha as part of a treatment, they're subjected to a 24 long, 24 week long treatment. People who actually respond to the treatment increase.